Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. from time to time because we know that the biggest battleground in our country today is the battle on the home. That we know that the home is the building block of all society. It's the building block of churches. That with strong homes you have a strong society. Strong homes you have a strong church. Weak homes, broken homes, you have a broken society. Weak homes, you have a weak church. And so therefore, we have to place emphasis on our home life. We need to make sure that we do our home work. And so if you don't mind, take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis and chapter number 2. The book of Genesis chapter 2, and if you don't mind, let's look together starting at verse number 21. The book of Genesis chapter number 2, and in verse 21, the word of God says this. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, will you mark a phrase that we find in the book of Genesis in chapter number 2? The book of Genesis chapter number 2, and notice with me at the very end of verse 24. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, notice the phrase, They shall be one flesh. They shall be one flesh flesh. And with the Lord's help, I'd like to preach this message here that they shall be one flesh. Let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And I thank you for how much you love us. And I thank you that you are the one who created man and woman. And that you had an intention for man and woman to become one flesh. Help us now as we explore the Bible and get an understanding of what that means to be one flesh. What you intended it to when you explain to them that they were to be one flesh and that we can make a practical application for it to strengthen up our own homes, to strengthen up our own marriages, that you could be pleased and use us and see answers to prayer. And we love you and in Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if you don't mind, as we examine this, we first want to start off with the context of this chapter. We want to understand what we're getting into. We know that in Genesis chapter 1, we have the recording of the creation of the world, that God created the world in six literal days. Then as we come to chapter 2, we can see that it starts off by finishing up the seventh day. Notice with me in verse 1, Genesis 2 and 1, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work in which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day, and from all of his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he had rested from all the work that he had made. So he begins by this chapter by explaining the seventh day. Now, in order to understand the context of it, what happens in verse number four is that it goes back and puts a special emphasis on the sixth day. So what is it? what's happening is not a continuation of the story. It's a stop and let's go back and magnify and put attention 
on what happened on that sixth day. What all occurred on the sixth day. And so what happens is that God created the Garden of Eden. Notice with me in verse 4. And these are the generations of the heaven and earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God had made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth. And every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. And there was not a man to till the ground. But there came up a mist on the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So we see that God has created the, what we would call the Garden of Eden. Then, starting at verse 7, he creates man. Notice, if you don't mind, <laughs> in verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into, into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living soul. So God created man out of the dust of the earth. He breathed life into him. Then the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man in whom he formed. So he created man, he placed him into a perfect garden, and out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, that is good for food, the tree of life in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out from the Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became four heads. And then it goes on and explains it. But he then noticed that man was alone. Notice if you don't mind in verse 15. And the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded man saying, Out of every tree of the garden thou must eat freely. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. For in the day that thou eatest thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should, uh, should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet. So God says, I got man. He, I've created everything else. Now we created man. And he needs a helpmeet. This word, by the way, carries the idea of being a completer. And that's what a helpmeet is, is that he is a completer. Or she is going to be a completer to man. They're going to be together side by side. We'll cover that in a second. But notice in verse 19, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave the names of all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to the beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helpmeet for him. So God looked down at Adam and said, you need a helpmeet. So what we're going to do is that we're going to have a parade of all of creation. And they're going to go before and whatever you call it, that's what it's going to be. And maybe out of all of this creation, you're going to look and see if you find someone that could be your completer, your helpmeet. And so the first comes up, you can imagine, a dog comes up. Oh, it's man's best friend, good doggy, pet behind the ears, wagging its tail. But as good as a friend of a dog is, it's not a completer. It's not a help me. And so good doggy, but that's not going to be what's going to complete me. Maybe next comes a little cat, and you can imagine meow, and it's purring, and it's enjoying to be held. It's a nice cat, not a mean cat. And they pet the cat and, well, as nice as the cat is, we could tell that the cat's going to be too selfish and it's not going to be a good helpmeet. It's not going to work out. And so they bring a horse and they look at the horse and they can see the strength of it, but this is not going to be a completer. They bring in a cow and they said, as much as this is going to be good, it's not going to be very comfortable. We're not going to get good hugs out of this. This is not going to work. And so bit by bit, he, God brings all the animals, all of the birds. He brings them forward so Adam can name them. But none of them could be a helpmeet. None of them is going to be a completer. None of them is going to be what he needs to advance forward, to be the man that God designed him to be. And so after seeing that all of man, uh, beast kind, animal kind, bird kind, none of those is going to be the completer, notice what God does then. In verse number 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And as he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. So what God does is he says, all right, Adam, I'm going to put you to sleep. And when you wake up, you're going to have your completer. And so he put him to sleep. By the way, the guy who invented anesthesia, 
The reason why he invented anesthesia was because he was reading his Bible and said, hey, before surgery, God put someone to sleep. Maybe we should do the same thing. And aren't you glad for that? That's usually a helpful thing. And so God caused Adam to go to a, into a deep sleep. And he took one of the ribs from Adam. And he closed the flesh back up. Now this doesn't mean that men are losing or have one less rib than women. Actually it's amazing that the rib, the bottom rib, is the only rib that will regenerate and grow back. God knew what he was doing. And so he took that rib and from a rib he made another rib mankind a woman because he she came out of man may I also remind you that it's important to know notice the rib that came out is that the rib came out and it's to be on the side of man not to be in the bottom of man or the head of man but to go alongside of man that they are to be together notice as he continues on in verse number 22 and the rib which the Lord had God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. And she should be called woman, because she was taken out of man. So because of this, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and they shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So the principle now goes up before is that a man and woman are each supposed to start their own household. They're supposed to leave the household of their mother and father and they're supposed to create their own household and that they are to become one flesh. And this is the emphasis that we want to put this emphasis here is that this idea of becoming one flesh. What does this mean? Well, if you don't mind, let's hit and define what I mean. The second thing I want to show you here is biblical marriage is two people becoming one. Biblical marriage is two people becoming one. Most people will usually see a marriage as a physical union. But there's more to that than just the physical. We are made up of more than just flesh we are made up of three parts. The book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23 states that we are made up of three parts. We're made up of spirit, we're made up of soul, and we're made up of body. Spirit, soul, and body. And so the principle of becoming one flesh is going to be coming one in spirit, one in soul, and one in in body. And by the way, this takes a lifetime of merging those two things into one. But if we're going to become one in spirit, one in soul, and one in body, we need to define terms. What do we mean by this? Well, let's define each of these parts, the spirit, soul, and the body. The spirit is the candle of the Lord. Now, a candle is a candle whether it is lit or not. If I have a candle and it's just sitting there, it's not lit, it's still a candle, right? If I light it, it doesn't change, it's still a candle. Well, the Bible says that our spirit is the place that when you come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell within you, that's the candle of the Lord. What happens is it becomes lit. But everyone is created with spirit. Everyone has a place for the Holy Spirit to dwell within them. And that we are to become one in spirit. Inside of our body, or our soul, we have three parts. So inside of our soul, there are three parts. Our soul is made up of intellect, will, and emotion. Intellect, will, and emotion. With our intellect, we think. With our emotions, we feel. With our will, we decide. But that is what's made up of our soul, of intellect, will, and our emotions. Then our body is our five senses, right? Taste, touch, smell, hearing, smelling, th those things, those five senses make up for our body. With our spirit, we are God conscience. With our soul, we are self-conscious. And with our body, we are world conscience. And so God has created us to be spirit, soul, and body. 
And so what must happen in order for us to become in one flesh, we have to become one together in spirit, in soul, and in body. Now the reason why I'm placing an emphasis on this is because we live in a world with so many broken marriages. And with the broken marriages, it's not because they're evil people. There are a lot of good, well-hearted, meaning people that have broken marriages because they have not been taught that they have to become in one flesh in spirit, in soul, and in body. Now the the flesh is easy. We understand the idea of becoming one in one flesh and that we have to spend time with them. When we develop the idea that we have to become one in soul, that means that we have to do things in three parts. That all three parts of the soul. We have to become one in intellect, meaning that we have to learn how to think like the other one thinks. The Bible gives the instruction to, to the husbands, husbands, Dwell with your wives according to knowledge. What does that mean? It means you have to study her. Why? Because there's going to be a test. And usually quite a bit of them. You need to dwell with your wife according to knowledge. You need to know what she likes. What she doesn't like. You need to know what she thinks. Why she thinks it. Sometimes you say, I don't know why. But you need to know how she's going to respond. You have to become one In knowledge, you have to be able to think like each other. The Bible says (laughs) that we are made up of spirit, soul, and body. I've explained that in our soul. We're made up of intellect. But we're also made up of emotion in our soul. Will or intellect, that's how we think, but emotion. Now, again, I have to do things from a male perspective because I'm a male. But you have to understand, gentlemen, your wife is emotional. And there's nothing you could do about it. There is no key. There is no switch to turn it off. So you have to understand how she feels and what she feels, even if it doesn't make logical sense. There's sometimes she doesn't know why she feels that way. But you have to develop the idea of becoming one in emotions as well to be able to understand that she has an emotional part of her and that by the way men you're not emotionless either you got emotions as well you get the football game that you want to watch and you'll have emotions as well or your favorite hobby or there's things that you're emotional about even if it's old yeller and you try not to (laughs) but we're made up of emotions and we have to learn how to become one in intellect, meaning that we have to spend time with each other and study each other and learn how each other thinks and be able to anticipate how they're going to think and be able to accept and mold how we think. Then the idea of emotions. You can't just write her off and say she's just being emotional. You have to understand her emotions and work with those emotions. And then our soul is also made up of will. That you have to learn how to make decisions together. And that you have to bring it to where both of you are in agreement. This is what we should do. Now I'm not saying that this is easy. You know what it is? It's the hardest thing. It was easy to get the rib out. Now the rest of the life trying to merge two individuals into one. It takes a lifetime. And by the way, each one of these is its own sermons. How to know your wife intellectually. How to know your spouse emotionally. How to come to the place where you're making decisions together. So we understand that we're made up of three parts. That we need to come together physically. We need to spend time with each other. With the idea of intellect and emotion. That also means that we have to do things with her. So many marriages that become troubled is because the husband is in one area of the room and the wife is in the other area of the room and they never have communication. That becomes a problem. And those who are in that state, they understand that's a problem. You have to be able to do things together. Even if it's something silly in your mind, like let's go to the store together. 
doing things together is such a big deal. Because that's where you learn how to relate to each other. You learn to see how they're responding. There has to be that one. It, it's not going to be easier to say, I'm going to let her do her own thing and I do my own thing. You have to become one together. Now, that's just the soul part. We have one more part that you have to come together in, and that's the spirit. That you have to come together in the spirit. Now, when we talk about this, there are spiritual things that we have to deal with. And in order to become one together in the spirit, you have to have the same goal. Going the same direction. You have to both be going towards Jesus. They say like this, a marriage is better illustrated with a triangle. That you have a husband and you have a wife, and they can't just come together horizontal. There's going to be always that gulf. But as both of them put their attention on the Jesus, and put their attention on the Lord, and start moving closer to God, they find themselves getting closer with each other. That's why we also have to work on the spiritual part. Because of that, and remember, I could preach a whole sermon on each one of these. I am not going to preach a message on how to become one in your intellect today. I'm not going to preach a message on how to become one in emotions today. I'm not going to preach a message on how to become one in will today. I might preach one of those later. But today I want to cover a little bit more of how to become one in spirit. How to become one in spirit. And the best way, listen to me, the best way for a man and a woman to become one together in the spirit is by praying together. Amen. By praying together. And may I say that because that's the best way, and may I say that maybe even the easiest thing, it is the hardest thing to do is to get a husband and wife to consistently pray together. Because it becomes a spiritual battle. And so if you don't mind, I want to be practical this morning. And I want to give you some tips. I want to give you some things you could do to be successful. So that way a husband and wife can become closer together spiritually by the medium of prayer. By them learning how to pray with each other. And by the way you have to be taught. Because if we try to do things. We can mess things up horribly bad. And we don't want to do that. So if you don't mind. I'm going to give you some things now. About praying together. If you don't mind. The very first principle I want to show you. With this idea of praying together as a couple here. Is that prayer is mostly <laughs> about seeking God. Prayer, the most importantly, is most importantly about seeking God. That is the most important thing. That is the, what you're supposed to do in prayer. Turn with me, if you don't mind, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4. So you, if you're in Exod or Genesis now, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy, chapter 4. And I'd like to show you a promise as we cover this first principle here, that prayer is most importantly about seeking God. I want you to be successful in for you and your spouse to get a hold of God together. I want you to be successful in becoming one in the Spirit. So we have to start off with this principle that most importantly, prayer is about seeking God. Notice with me Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 29. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 29. Notice with me if you don't mind. In ver chapter 4 verse 29. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God. Thou shalt find him. If thou seek him with all thy heart. And with all thy soul. God makes a promise that if you look for him. He will be found. And the reason why I'm stating this is that both parties need to have the same goal in prayer that we're praying together to seek God. That if you're going to become one in flesh or one in the spirit, become one flesh, you have to have the same goal. If both people are seeking God when they're praying together, they're going to come closer together. 
Now, as a practicality, you could do this by preparing yourself to seek God. Maybe before it's time to pray with your wife, take some time by yourself. Clear out whatever you need to clear out so you could do it with an honest heart. And the reason why we say this is because prayer is not time to preach to your spouse while you have a captive audience. All right, I'm going to talk to God and God, you need to make sure she does dishes right. I'm tired of finding those dishes here. So God, or the wife saying, listen here, God, you know how badly he treats me. So God, you fix him. You're not seeking God at the time. And the prayer is not going to be very successful. This is not the time to preach at your partner and tell them everything that they're right. And then turn around and say, no, I'm talking to God. You're just, that's, it's not your purpose now is to correct them. Your purpose is to seek God together. To go together to talk to God. To spend time with him. Let me tell you, that's all prayer is, by the way, is you're just talking to God. Talking to him like he's a real person. You're telling him what you feel. You're telling him what you're thinking. And you're joining together. Let me tell you, during this prayer time, as they're talking to God, they reveal more of their heart than if you just had a conversation with them. You can see as they're talking to God, what's on their mind. What's going on in their spirit. What's disturbing them. You could learn so much about them. This is why this prayer time is important. But again, you have to make sure you're talking to the right audience. For example, I heard of a girl once who was uh, <laughs> decided she was going to pray to God for a Christmas present. And so she said, God, I want that doll, the pretty doll, the one that is able to suck on the bottle and to wet the bed and to change the diaper. God, I want that doll. When she was done praying, the, her mother came up and said, why are you talking so loud? God can hear you. Yeah, but grandma can't. Who was she talking to? She was talking to grandma and not to God. We need to realize who we're talking to. If you're talking to God and she's talking to God, you're going to grow closer together. Her spirit's going to be revealed. Your spirit's going to be revealed. And they're going to get knit closer but both of you have to make that decision. We're going to look towards God. This is it my time to fix her. This is it my time to tell on her to God. This is we're going to seek God together. We're going to talk to him together. And we're going to speak to him. That both parties have to seek towards God. That most importantly, prayer is about talking to God. To seeking to God. As we now come to a second practical idea here is to pick a specific time and make a commitment to pick a specific time and make a commitment you know you make doctor's appointments you have at a time that you're supposed to show up to work that's just how we function we function off of schedules what will happen is that a man and wife they'll be well-meaning and say we need to pray together honey that's great when are we going to do it? Well, whenever we get time. You know what's going to happen? You're never going to have time. Something is always going to jump in the way. So you need to find a specific time. Now, I know that's hard because we have people that work different schedules. My wife and I, for so many years, one of us has always worked an off schedule, whether it was midnights or whatever else. We know that it's a fight. And because of that, it's hard to develop the habit. But you have to pick a time that works for both of you. If uh, she goes to work at four in the morning, then nine o'clock at night is probably not the best time to pray with her. You, there's a practicality. Uh, if you're a type of people that push snooze 10 times in a row and then you rush out the door, then right before you go to work is probably not the time to schedule that appointment because everything's going to jump in the way. And so you need to put some forethought. You have to put some attention, but you have to schedule it and then commit to keep it. Meaning that this is the time we're going to pray and this is the we're going to have to guard it. Put it on your schedule. Guard it. Don't double book anything. Now, don't be frustrated if, if uh, something does happen one time. Remember, this is going to be developing the habit and it takes time to develop habits. But you need to set a time and keep it. Schedule it. Make a commitment that this is important to both of you. And that this is something that needs to be done. 
And again, this is just practical help, but it's st- things that we need to state because if you do come to the place, if we get time, we'll pray together. You'll never have time. Something will always jump in the way. If you come to the place where you say, I'm going to do it here, you've got to make sure that both parties are able to do it then. You know, if he works from 9 to 5, you don't want to schedule it at 3.30 and then get mad because he's not there. All right, I know that's being facetious, but you got to, times that you know that both of you are going to be there and that both of you can commit. Now, you're going to have to fight for that time. You have to realize this is important, but fight for that time. <laughs> and by the way, it should be different. Husbands and wife personal time should be different than praying with a family. You should pray with a family. Your kids should be able to hear you pray and you should be able to hear your kids pray. But don't blend that family time with husband and wife time praying and talking with the Lord. They need to be separate times where you're talking to the Lord together. So again, I'm trying to be practical this morning, talking about becoming one together in spirit by praying together. That we come with the first principle that prayer, the most important part of it is seeking after God. Second of all, to pick a specific time and make a commitment for it. Third of all, as we come just being practical, don't pray long and take turns praying out loud. Don't take long And take turns praying out loud. Now let me explain what I mean by this. That this is not the time for you to catch up on your prayer life. You haven't prayed all week. And so now you're going to unload it all at this one time in prayer. That's not the time to catch up and pray around the world. That you want to be courteous of this. All of us have enough flesh that if we listen to someone pray for 30 minutes. Guess what's going to happen? You're going to go to sleep. And then the other one wakes you up and says, wasn't you listening? Well, it was trying. So as a practicality, pray short prayers and bounce it back and forth. Commune with God. Uh, You already have your own prayer time with God. And so you're not catching up, but you're ready to go. Take one thought to the Lord. And as one person is praying, that other person join with you to the throne room of grace. And carry that prayer up together in your mind. But don't pray long prayers. Take a thought, pray it out, bounce it to the next person. Pray it out, bounce it back and forth. There may be some times that your prayer time is short together. And there may be some times that it goes long. Meaning that you take turns back and forth. But what happens is you learn to commune to God together. It's not, I have my prayer time, now I get to go beat her prayer time and Guys are competition that way. We don't, don't get competition in prayer. Bounce it back and forth. Have a natural conversation with God. But take one thought. Bring, and then take the other person bring a thought. The other person. They may even continue with that same thought. But just talk to God together. But don't pray long. This isn't your time to show how spiritual you are. Your wife already knows how spiritual you are. This is just a time for both of you together to just give a thought to God. Give another thought to God. And this is a time where you're joining together as you're communing with God. One person is praying. The other one is bringing it to the throne room of grace. Once that thought's been to the throne room, the other person brings it up. And just a natural back and forth. Again, another practicality. As we continue, let's just make one more practicality here. Is that as you pray together, God will produce a unity between you. As you pray together, God will place a unity between you. Turn with me, if you don't mind, to the New Testament promise of this. Matthew chapter 18. The gospel record of Matthew in chapter 18. And let's see as Jesus gives this principle. Many of you have quoted this. Many of you have brought this up. But let's go ahead and see together here. Matthew chapter 18, Jesus is dealing with the idea of prayer in this specific incidence and talking about how we can have unity. In specific, it's talking about unity of a church, but the same principle can be applied here in the idea of unity, praying together as a husband and wife. Notice with me in Matthew chapter 18. 
Matthew chapter 18, and notice with me in verse number 19. Matthew 18 and verse 19. Again, I say unto you, that if two, that's a husband and wife, they could do that, they could be two, shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Here's the idea of getting unity. That as we pray together and we're seeking to God and we're agreeing together, say that my husband and what. Uh, my wife and I are praying, and we're praying for someone to get saved. As we pray together, there's a unity. God is there in the midst, and God answers prayers. Let me tell you, as I go back for the next, I've been married now for 16 plus years. As we've been uh, together, I could tell you that the most awesome, the most jaw-dropping prayers is when she and I have prayed together, and we watch these prayers. Uh, uh, answers to prayer happen. There's just something about agreeing together, about joining together. And God made a promise. If two of you to ask together and you're seeking God and saying, God, what would you have us to do about this? That God will answer. And then we're closer together because we say, look, we pray together. Look and see what God did. There's that process of becoming one in the spirit. Gentlemen, let me tell you that the greatest asset you have in the ministry and ministry things is your wife. To learn to pray together, to learn to access God together is one of the most amazing things. If you have family problems, financial problems, physical problems, let me tell you the greatest thing that could happen is for you two to join together and to pray through those things and watch God not only answer those prayers, but watch you get closer because you prayed together. Again, this may sound fanatical. For someone who's not used to such thing, they may say, I don't know if this will work. Put it to the test. Try it. See if it doesn't work. The most amazing answers to prayer will happen when a husband and wife learns to pray together. Becoming one in the spirit by the medium of prayer. Now remember, the whole purpose of God, what God designed biblical marriage to be in the first place was for two individuals to become one flesh in both spirit, soul, and body. And there are practical aspects for all of those. We're just hitting one today about becoming one in the spirit, one of the greatest ways for two individuals to become one together is by learning to pray together. Now it requires a commitment. It requires an idea that two people are going to get together. They're going to agree we're going to seek God. We're going to agree that we're going to pray together at a set time. We're going to look for God's answers to prayer. And watch God bring them together. What an amazing thing. If this is something you apply in your own lives, not only will you see amazing answers to prayer this year, but your marriages will be stronger than, you ever, than they ever were before. May I say, they will be stronger than you ever thought was possible. Just something simple of a husband and wife making a decision that we are going to pray together. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, 
please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.